Welcome to 1122 Online. We're grateful you decided to join us as we come together to make much of Jesus through worship and word. If you're new here, we're excited to have you with us. And if you're returning, welcome back. That's right, welcome back. We are one church in many locations seeking to discover and deepen our relationship with Jesus while encouraging others to do the same. That's right. Today, we're in a series titled Be Free, a study of Galatians. Paul sets the stage by emphasizing the source of his authority and the central theme of his message, freedom in Christ. That's right, Paul highlights the redemptive work of Christ as the cornerstone of our freedom. Christ is the source of true freedom. Our freedom in Christ is not a license to indulge in sin by no means, as Paul would say it, but a call to holy living, guided by the Spirit's transformative work within us. So as we journey through the scriptures and discover the various aspects of freedom found in our Lord Jesus Christ, we also wanna encourage you to visit us on YouTube where you can join us for live services, stay current on the series, rewatch previous sermons, and indulge in other on-demand content like the Deepen Podcast with Pastor Joe Lee Martin. As we embark on this journey through the book of Galatians, may we fix our gaze upon the liberating truth of the gospel, the truth that in Christ we are free indeed. Let us embrace this freedom with grateful hearts, walking in the light of His grace and extending His love to a world yearning for release from the chains of sin and death. From whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Now let's worship together right now. Is it? Oh, if you believe, 
things that seem impossible on the surface are possible through the power of Jesus. Come on, he's so good to us. We're gonna teach y'all a new song this morning. It's called, The Lamb, The Lion, The King. And in Revelation 5, it says this, Weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And if you read down a little further in verse 12, it says, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Notice the significance that Jesus is both the lamb, the spotless lamb who was slain for the forgiveness of all sins and the triumphant line of Judah who reigns forevermore. Only Jesus, come on. So we're just gonna worship him for all that he's been to us and all that he will continue to faithfully be. The chorus of the song goes like this. You are and you always will be the savior of the world who gave everything for me. The one all of heaven calls worthy. The lamb, the lion, the king. Yes, you are so worthy, Jesus. 
up your name this morning. We give you praise for all that you've done, for all that you are. God, 
God, I pray that if there's anything in me today that brings a religious spirit to the table, any of us in this room, God, it feels like we're coming here to earn your favor, to earn your affection. Father, I pray would you just completely quench that spirit? Would you allow us to realize the thanksgiving that we have in you, the thanksgiving that we praise you with, Lord God, as an overflow of all that you've done in our lives. That's all we bring to the table, is our messed up lives coming into contact with the grace and the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. So Lord, thank you for this opportunity we have to come together as your church, as your bride, to lift up your name, to celebrate the freedom that we have in you. We give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we all say. Amen. What a joy to get to celebrate our resurrected King. There is no power like the resurrected Jesus. Amen. It's a joy to get to worship Him today with all of you here in the room and all of you online. As the church, we want to help you. We have a vision, a calling that we want to glorify God by making disciple, making disciples. And that can be confusing. What it means is as disciples of Jesus, we want to make disciples that make disciples because we want to see the good news, the gospel of Jesus, go to the ends of the earth so that his glory would cover the earth like the waters cover the seas. And one of the ways that we want to do that, and we have created to help you do that, is our app. If you don't have it, you can go on whatever uh, mobile device that you have. You can pull up on your app store and you can download it. Uh, If you already have it, you can update it. We launched a new app on Monday that is loaded with tons of things that we have been praying about for a long time to help you make disciples that make disciples. You can get the sermons on there. You can get disciple group curriculum on there. The Deepen podcasts are on there. You can give on there. We actually create exclusive discipleship resources that are only put on that app. So make sure this is one of the acceptable times in church you can pull your phone out. You can do something with it that isn't taking notes. Uh, You can go download that right now. It also has a daily feature. We put all of our Bible reading plan is on there. You can put prayer requests on there. We hope that it helps you to deepen your faith. We pray that it helps you to help someone discover theirs. As a church, we are in a 14-week series walking through the book of Galatians. uh, And we've called this series Be Free because we want to lean into the freedom that God has for us. One of the things we decided to do in this series as part of our worship service was to read emails that have been sent in from 1122ers around the world as they share the freedom that they've experienced in God. And today, I have an email from Kyle in Indiana. Kyle says, I started my walk with Christ around a year ago or so. I wholeheartedly believe Jesus saved me from suicide. After my divorce and not seeing my little boy, and he put in parentheses, ain't no pain like kid pain, amen? Kyle says, I struggled with life, and he did. He turned in every direction that he should not have turned at that point. And he felt like he was too far gone from God. Maybe you've been there. At a very low point in Kyle's life, a friend called him. Listen to what he says. Kyle says, I believe that that was the work of our Heavenly Father, telling me that he wasn't done with me. And that's where my faith and my walk began. Now I truly believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and saved me that night. Amen. Praise God, Kyle, for what he's doing in your life. Listen, if you're here or you're watching online and you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, we love you as a church. We're here to pray for you, to fight with you. You can text the word CARE to 441122 so that we can get in there with you because the voice of the enemy sounds an awful lot like your own voice inside of your head, and we would love to tell you how much God loves you and that he has a plan for your life. Which means, just like in Kyle's life, he's not done with us. He has something he wants to say to all of us today. So grab a Bible, grab a pen, and something to write on, and let's continue to worship through Connie's testimony. I grew up in the faith of Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses do believe that Jesus did come and die. However, apparently it wasn't enough. So they had to supplement what Jesus did with these good works, and that's why they were so important. From the time I was in a stroller, I was going door to door. Um, You had to attend three services a week, a theocratic ministry school to teach you how to reach people. You know, I was fine until I became 19. I had dated, and I made a series of really poor decisions, and I sinned. I went to my father. He was there. There was no judgment. There was just nothing but love. 
And at the end, as an elder in the local congregation, he knew and I knew that I had an obligation to go before the elders and confess my sin. There were 12 men and me at 19, and the options were to confess and repent or to be disfellowshipped. I questioned that several times, like, why do I have to go before these 12 men? They don't know me. I turned the tables on those 12 men. We debated the questions that I had been riddled with my entire teen years, and that is, how can I have an imperfect father who shows more love than the God that you talk about as Jehovah God? You answer my questions, I will repent and confess. You don't answer my questions, I will disassociate myself from the organization. I was excommunicated. I wanted nothing to do that was going to filter God's love through rules. Fortunately, I had an aunt who prayed faithfully for those 13 years for me to find Jesus. And then a friend of mine, she got a postcard in the mail for a non-denominational church. And we decided we would go. I sat there and the message was Jesus, the Lamb of God. It was just about, he loves me. He loves me. I had been searching for that love my entire life. And I thought, there it is, that's the peace, that's the love that I've never seen that I never experienced, that when I needed it, it wasn't there because it didn't fit the rules. That was it, that was it. I surrendered my life and became a Christian. And in 2015, God called me to 1122. The following September was saturated and Pastor Kwan was preaching that night. And at the end of his message, he said, I want everybody just to sit and ask the Holy Spirit for a word. And the Holy Spirit's like, your word is freedom. I now am free to go running to Jesus every day. What was missing before was I didn't have a relationship with my Savior. And because of that personal relationship, it's not just about going to heaven. It's about, oh my goodness, you loved me so much, me that you hung on that cross. And that's no longer a means to eternity. That's love. Jesus transformed my life from surviving to living a free and abundant life to help those that are hurting. Now he is preparing me to bring equine therapy for emotionally broken and hurting women. I know that no matter what situation I walk into, he's right here. And so I might be nervous, but I'm not fearful because this God who came down to earth and died for me is never going to forsake me. He's always there. Amen, amen, amen. If you got your Bibles, I hope you do, grab them. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 1. We're studying this book for 14 weeks, and in my Bible, it's only this big. And for some, but I use the ELP version, you know what that is, extra large print. So for many of you, it's only that big. God bless your eyesight. And we are digging in to what the gospel offers to us, what the gospel is and what it offers to us. And one of the things I want to say to you based on that testimony is if you've ever been beaten up, battered, and bruised by the church or by any religious organization or people in the name of God hurt you, then I want to say welcome to the church of 1122. We are a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you got kicked out somewhere else, you're probably going to fit in real good here. And I am so sorry, so sorry that somebody in the name of the Lord beat you up. But listen, man, this is like the island of misfit toys of churches around here. I mean, look around. Look who you're seated next to. Can you believe it? And yet here we are. But, but I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for watching online. And whatever you do, please, please, please don't turn away from God because you had a negative experience with religious people. Jesus had negative experiences with religious people all the time, and he was God. Amen? And so we're going to dig in today. Um, grab your Bibles, Galatians chapter 1. We also have uh, these Galatian journals in the Resource Center, if you want one, it's pretty cool. It's just like the Bible on one side and a place to take notes on the other. Part of the reason I want you to get your Bible out and look at it is I need you to see that I'm not making this up. We just teach directly from God's Word. And we're walking through this week by week 
by week, and he says this. And by the way, I just want you to know, man, I love you. This might sting a little bit, okay? So if it gets a little offensive at, point, at points, sweet. It's kind of the intent. Just do me one favor. If you're offended, no problem, no problem. You can only be offended for you, though, okay? Deal? Don't get offended for somebody else. Let them be offended for themselves. And if you are offended and you want to email me at jimmycrasscorn at I don't care, that, dot com, that's great. And if you think that's my actual email address, you're not going to understand anything we're talking about anyway. It's just going to be whoop, right over there. But he was mean. Okay, cool. Here we go. He's, we're going to pick it up in verse 6. And Pastor Adam let us know last week as he kicked it off that one of the things that makes the letter to the church in Galatia unique is there's no thanksgiving, there's no prayer, and nowhere does he call the Galatians the saints. And all the other books that he writes or letters that he writes, the eight other ones, it always starts out real ooey-gooey, and it's awesome. It's like, to the Philippians, oh, how my heart yearns to see you when I remember our tears day and night. Not in this one. He's like, Galatians, Paul. First thing he starts out with, after he does the introductions, he says in verse six, I am astonished. Can you imagine getting a letter like that from your dad? Sean, dad, what are you doing? So this would be like, if it was a text, it's all caps. Everybody understand where we're going here. <laughs> if you're a grandparent and you, you're freaking out your grandchildren when you text them in all caps, okay? <laughs> Verse six, I am astonished. It's like that, it's me. That you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That word is anathema. It means damned to hell. That's what that means. Pretty strong letter, isn't it? As we have said before, when did you say this before, Paul? In the sentence I just finished. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed, anathema, damned to hell. This is a really, really big deal. Why is he getting so upset? Because what we're talking about here is life or death. And even bigger than our temporary on earth life or death, he is talking about eternal life or eternal death. That a year before he writes this letter, he and a bunch of his buddies go on this missionary trip, this missionary journey. He preaches the gospel in the area of Galatia. A bunch of people get saved. He raises up leaders. He anoints and appoints elders and pastors. They start a church that starts a bunch of little churches and everything's going super good. And within one year, some people have moved in and said, you heard Paul say to you that Jesus is enough and I'm here to tell you Jesus isn't enough. There's some things that you have to add to this gospel that you've heard. The gospel is good, it's just not good enough. And Paul, Paul says this is very, very, very serious. And Paul says that they are preaching to you another gospel, but there's only one gospel. So let's, let's talk about what the gospel is. If you're gonna come to 1122, you gotta know the gospel. And some of you that come here all the time are like, well, don't you preach it every week? Uh-huh, I do. This is it, I got one message. Different intro, different clothes, gospel, gospel, gospel. That's what we do here, okay? The word gospel in the Greek is euangelion. And it means good news, not good advice. It's good news for salvation, not good advice so you can be a better version of you. These are very, very different things. It, uh, they actually borrowed this, this old this, this old Greek word, euangelion, and it, and it just mean, it means heralder of good news. And what would happen is, if a king won a battle, then he would send his evangelist, he would send his messenger out, and the messenger would show up to a new city and say, behold, I bring you good news. This is what I bring to you, good news. Your king has defeated the enemy, and because of that, you can live at peace. That is good news. And that is what the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is. It's news, which means it happened and it has to be reported. From 30,000 foot view, the good news of the gospel is this. If you wanna understand your entire Bible, you can understand it in three words. God with us. At creation, God. 
One God in three persons out of an overflow of God's love for God's self creates human beings for them to be in right relationship with him, face to face with a holy and perfect God, God with us. And then Adam and Eve sin, and when sin enters the world, it fractures that relationship with God. Then how in the world can an unholy people stand in the presence of a holy God? They can't. And so God redeems them and rescues them, and he gives them the law. This is what the whole Old Testament is. It's a series of sacrifices to point to the ultimate coming sacrifice so that for a time being, God's people can be with God in his presence through all the rituals and sacrifices, etc. God with us. And then, what we celebrate is Christmas, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. That God becomes a man, fully God, fully man. God with us. And Jesus comes and he says, I don't, I'm not just trying to show you a way, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus lives a perfect life. He accomplishes every promise and prophecy of the old covenant. Then he goes to the cross and he dies not just for us but instead of us. And at the cross, when Jesus pushes up on his nail-pierced feet and says, it is finished, a part of what he means is the debt that we have incurred by our sin against God has been paid in full at the cross. And for anyone who would believe that when he died on the cross, it counted for us, then we get credited with his perfect life and he takes the blame for all of our sin and then we can be back to that face-to-face relationship with God, God with us. He deposits the Holy Spirit, so it's actually better. It's like God in us. And then one day when he returns, the heavens are going to crack open. You're going to hear a trumpet. He's showing up with tattoos and sword mouth and like fire eyes. And he ain't coming back to tell stories anymore. He's back to judge the quick and the dead. And for anybody that would put their faith in him before that moment, then we are taken to heaven, God with us. And what makes heaven heaven It's not angels and streets of gold and plenty to eat and harp music. What makes heaven heaven is God that we get forever with him. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this, different letter to a different church. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, he says, now I would remind you, brothers, I don't know if you know this, you gotta remind church people stuff because they don't pay attention. (laughs) Tell your neighbor, pay attention. So you didn't even do it, that's all I know. Wake up, now, come on. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And then he's gonna lay out the gospel. For I delivered to you as of first importance. In other words, Paul is saying, of all the things you can preach, about how to be a husband and how to be a wife and how to raise kids, and how to, the most important thing, the thing of first importance is the gospel. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance to the scriptures. That's what the gospel is. The life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. So he's saying, you don't believe me? Go knock around in Jerusalem and you're gonna meet some people that saw the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me. The gospel is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus in accordance to the scripture to you. That's just what the gospel is. Now, does the gospel have implications? Oh, for sure, about how we should treat one another and how we should fight for justice and how we should do all kind of stuff. But those implications of the gospel are not the gospel, do not get those things confused. The gospel according to the Bible, life, death, resurrection of Jesus for you in accordance with the scripture. Or maybe you grew up Baptist, you're gonna love this Baptist. The Roman road, you know the Roman road? All you gigglers just gave yourself away, okay? I I could probably call on you and with great pride you would stand up and say it faster than everybody else, all right? In In the book of Romans, Paul lays out the gospel. What I want you to see here is every letter that Paul writes was consistent. The gospel never changed. The Roman road is this, in Romans 3.23, Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, that word fallen short, got any bow hunters in the house? If you're a bow hunter, raise your hand, higher than that. I need to see who I need to spend time with. All right, all right. That word fallen short of the glory of God is an archery term. 
It means miss the mark. The idea is, in order for you to hit the mark and go to heaven, you have to hit a perfect bullseye every time. And whenever you have sinned, you have missed the mark. And so even if you could hit the mark every time between now and eternity, what are you gonna do about all the ones that you have missed before? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so what that means is, what you earn, listen, one of the things that we hear in our culture all the time, which makes me pull my hair out, is this. Well, that's not fair. Listen, you don't want fair. According to the Bible, fair is you go to hell. Fair, you want fair? You want a good parenting tip? Next time your kid's like, that's not fair. You tell them, Pastor Joby said, fair is they would burn in an eternal lake of fire forever. <laughs> Grace is you get to live indoors in the air condition at my house, okay. Why, because the wages, that's not a parenting tip, again. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. What you earn, what you deserve, what I deserve, the wages of sin is death. But there's an alternative, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. In Romans 5, 8, Paul says, but God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. The order is everything. It doesn't say, for all of you good people that pulled yourself up by your bootstraps, which by the way is impossible, try that when you get home. It's impossible. For all of you that cleaned yourself up, I've got good news, you have earned a visit from God. It's the exact opposite. But God demonstrated, he proved once and for all, that before you did anything, before you showed up to church, before you took a shower, before you quit cussing so much, before you quit drinking so much during the week, whatever your thing is, before you did anything, God demonstrated his love for us in this. In our current situation as sinners, Christ died for us. And then Romans 10, 9, so there's four verses. 3, 3, 6, 23, 5, 8, and 10, 9. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God resurrected him from the grave, you will be saved. Amen. That is what the gospel is. So, Paul is consistent, the Bible is consistent throughout the whole New Testament. In fact, in the book of Galatians, he's already laid out kind of a summation of the gospel in verses three and four that Pastor Adam preached last week. He says this, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In other words, you want grace and peace? The way you get grace and peace is the gospel. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us. You can't deliver yourself, man. You ever get an Amazon package and the Amazon package brought itself to you ha your house? No, no, you chose it and then someone delivered it. Next time you walk out on your front door and you see a package, I want you to think about salvation. By the way, if we don't have a package at my house, I have to call FedEx, but you okay, you all right, y'all die? <laughs> Every day, okay? Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God and our, the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. You see, this is the gospel. And if you think, if you think you have to clean yourself up and make yourself presentable to the Lord, that's like thinking that you gotta wait for the bleeding to stop to go to the ER. It just doesn't make sense. Now what begins to happen, the longer you hang out with church, at church, the longer you hang out at church, the thing you're going to have to war against is what was happening in Galatia. They say, yeah, we believe in Jesus and we believe the gospel, but it's the gospel plus there's this other stuff that you have to do. And so you gotta pay attention to this. And so listen, man, I know some of you look like you went to Sunday school with Moses, okay, I get it. And the longer you're here, the more you will begin to look at other people and be like, what are they doing here? Listen, this is not a country club for the elite. This is an emergency room for people that are beaten up and battered and bruised by the enemy. Amen? And so it's always going to be a little grimy around here. Why? Because we are a movement for all people to get this gospel, to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus. So Paul says, I am astonished. I am astonished. What are you doing? That's what he's saying. 
Why in the world would you reject this free offer of the gift of salvation and try to add something to it as if God needed you and your help for your salvation? Now, particularly, there was a group called the Judaizers. These were Jewish Christians who came from Jerusalem, and they said, listen, man, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for your sin and was raised on the third day, and that's great. And he gets you almost all the way to heaven but then you have to do your part to take that one more step to make it all the way in. And what, he, what they were talking about in particular was circumcision and obeying the law. And he's like, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? And listen, circumcision wasn't a bad thing. Circumcision for the Jewish people was a symbol or a picture of God's covenant love for his people. But to the Gentiles in Galatia, they were like, do what? Can you imagine as a grown man? Be like, all right, there's two things you need. You need faith and surgery to get in. So the new members class was all women at Galatia. <laughs> the dudes were like, we'll watch online. I think we're just gonna watch it from here. <laughs> all right. And he's like, I'm gonna stop, what are you doing? That you are so quickly deserting him. Please know this, to, to add to the gospel, you're not just turning your back on a doctrine, you're turning your back on him, on Jesus. He says, who called you? This is personal. Don't you remember when he called you? Don't you remember when you realized that you were a wretched, black-hearted sinner and it was the grace of Jesus that covered you? This is very, very personal. I know it's very popular these days and you can get a lot of followers on Instagram if you publicly deconstruct from your faith. Let me, let me tell you. As I've dug into what some of these people are doing, they're not actually deconstructing from the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're deconstructing from a church culture that they, didn't, that they don't agree with today. Let me tell you who never will deconstruct from their faith. The person that has tasted and seen that the Lord has good. The, the person that has known the grace of God poured out for them. Are there all kind of cultural things that even you learn at church that you should question? Sure, no problem. What, but when God calls you, do not turn away from that. He says, who called you in the grace of Christ. You see, it's by grace that we are saved through faith. Not by works. The only thing that you and I bring to our salvation is the sin that requires it, that's it. And he says that, that you are turning to a different gospel. You see, when you become a Christian, that's what you do, you turn, you repent. You were facing the world and you had your back to the Lord and then you repent, you change your mind and you turn and you say, I'm gonna put my back to the world and I'm going to face Jesus. And he's saying, whatever you do, if you try to add to the gospel, then the problem is, is that you're doing that in reverse order. You are turning your back on the one who saved you. And so he says, you're, you're turning to a different gospel, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of truth. That word distort literally means reverse. It means reverse, and here's the problem. The gospel order matters. And what the Judaizers and Galatians are doing is they're reversing the order. You see, the good news of the gospel is this, is that God calls us, and then we receive and respond to him, not the other way around. It's not like we act and then he responds to us. You see, the gospel is we are accepted Therefore, we obey. That's the right order. The wrong order is, if we obey, then we will be accepted. That is not the gospel. Or the way I say it around here all the time is this. The gospel is that identity precedes activity. That when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he tells you who you are, and because of what he has done for us, it changes the things we do. So of course we don't have to do the things we used to do because we're not the people that we used to be. The old us is dead and we're alive in Christ. But if you begin to believe that activity precedes identity, then you got it wrong. Then you think God's gonna give you a test and he's gonna wait and examine your grade and if you do good enough, then he will let you know if you're in. And again, what's happening here is the Judaizers are saying it's Jesus plus the law. This is no gospel. Now, it's easy to like pick on this because this isn't a thing that we think about all the time, okay? However, 
this is happening in the church all the time. In all kind of churches and all kind of parachurches and cults and all kind of stuff. And there are modern day Judaizers all over the place. And so what has happened is that people take biblical, historical, orthodox gospel and then begin to add to it. Like in the video that we just watched about Miss Connie, she grew up a Jehovah's Witnesses, a Jehovah's Witness. In uh, 1872, a guy named Charles Russell starts this organization. He had a great difficulty dealing with the doctrine of eternal hellfire. And so he sat down and began to study it for himself, and he also denied eternal punishment, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And so he began to publish these magazines. Today they're called the Watchtower Magazines. And then the problem with the Watchtower Magazines was the Bible, because they didn't line up. So then what he did is he wrote his own version of the Bible to match the doctrines you find in the magazines. And you think, who would do that? You, every day of your life. It's just true, man. There's what is and there's what ought to be. And submission is a submission until you disagree. I mean, when you get to that part in the Bible, you're like, I can't believe God would say that. Well, that's cute. So you create your own world, you can make up what you want to. Until then, you have two options. You could be the Lord of your own life or you could submit and surrender to the creator God of this one. And so, that's what he did though, is that there was a bunch of stuff he didn't like, so he just, he, just, he, he rewrote the Bible. And again, it's, it's, it's a distortion. There are a lot of the same words in there, but a big part of what they don't believe is that salvation is by grace through faith alone. He claimed that the Bible could only be understood according to his interpretation. That's a dangerous arrangement, right? Since he controlled what was written. And again, they teach that Jesus was created, that was not uh, co-equal with God the Father. They also teach that faith alone does not save you, but works must be added. And you may think about this and you may say, well, I know some Jehovah's Witness and they're so nice. Yeah, I mean, if you get excommunicated or not, but if you're an outsider, so nice, so lovely. Some of the kindest humans I've ever met in my life. But kindness will not justify you before the Lord. The finished work of Christ does. Uh, uh, another group that's similar are the Mormons. Joseph Smith, in 1823, when he was 17 years old, so you know it's gonna be solid, because if anybody knows all things, <laughs> it's a 17-year-old. <laughs> he said he was visited by an angel named Maroni, Italian angel, I guess who was supposed to be the son of a Mormon, and he was the leader of a people called the Nephites, who had, also, who had lived in the Americans, with the Native Americans, appeared to him and told him that he, Joseph Smith, had been chosen to translate the Book of Mormon, which was compiled by this angel's father in the fourth century. So the angel says to him, okay, the Bible's fine, but it's the Bible plus the Book of Mormon. And so, Joseph Smith writes the Book of Mormon. He said that it was, uh, it, it was like an angelic language on these gold plates, but he had the special gift to translate them, and in 1830, he writes the Book of Mormon. And Mormon Angel teaches that forgiveness of sin is obtained by obedience, funny enough, to the book he wrote. In fact, their doctrinal statement says, one of the most fallacious doctrines originated by Satan and, and propounded by man is that man is saved alone by the grace of God. That belief in Jesus Christ alone is all that is needed for salvation. Now, man didn't say that. That's called Ephesians 2. That's where that's found. So this is no gospel. And then he says, but an angel told me. Which I would say to Joseph Smith, bro, that wasn't an angel. There are fallen angels. And of course they say things you want to hear. The Bible says that, that, that the devil himself masquerades as an angel of light. And actually, Paul says in verse eight, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be damned to hell. Let him be accursed. And again, if you're not a Mormon, you kind of sit back and like, I don't think I'm gonna get into that, all right? Good. But you know what we can do? Is we can begin to subjugate the revealed word of God to our feelings and our experience. You know the biggest way to defang the word truth these days is to put a possessive pronoun in front of it. To say, well, that's my truth, or that's your truth. Hey, listen, man, you get opinions. Have all the opinions that you want. You know, and they're like armpits. Everybody's got a couple, and they stink. That's just what they are. Now, 
But there's just the truth. There's just the truth. And the truth is not a set of propositions. The truth is a person. His name is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. Now, it would be easy for me to just pick on all the people outside of the Christian church, but why don't we just take a little stroll through our own backgrounds and experiences, okay? And if you want to play the game of like identify the denomination, that'll be fun. Okay, keep it to yourself. Don't, don't shout it out. That's a Baptist. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> Here we go. Today's legalism, today's fundamentalist Christian legalism is a version of what the Judaizers were doing in the first century. That, that Jesus, I mean, nobody would explicitly say this. Like the, and I know this one well, because I grew up in the South, and I, and I got saved at a fundamentalist Baptist camp, and they knew how to put the fun in fundamentalism, if you know what I mean. And they would preach that it's salvation in Christ alone, plus, here's a bunch of stuff you can't do. Because if you do these things, then you don't really believe in Jesus. And our list, we didn't even need 10 commandments. We just had a few. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't go with girls who do. Those were our commandments. It was Jesus plus this. And that was great until it wasn't. That was great. And so, I mean, I grew up in Dillon, so the prom queen was like, how y'all doing, okay? (laughs) Listen, if you don't know what that is, welcome. I know you moved here from California or New York. Welcome to Jacksonville. Some of our pastors may have a dip in right now, okay? That's just true. So. I mean, I, I was told you couldn't go to Raider movies. If you went to Raider movies, what happens if Jesus returned and you're at Terminator 2? You ain't getting in. And I'm like, I don't remember that in the Gospels. I thought I was saved by grace, you know? And then when the Passion of the Christ came out, their head exploded. They didn't know what to do. It's a Rated R movie about Jesus. Ah! Okay. So, I didn't go to church much, but, but when I did, this is the message that I heard is not the gospel. They would preach, God is good, you are bad. Try harder, see you next week. And so everybody's faith became sin management. Now listen, we should should be, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we should be attacking sin that's trying to kill us. I'm not pro-sin. Sin's a big deal. Jesus had to die on the cross to do something about it. But if you think you being a good Christian means you managing your sin, there's no such thing as a good Christian. There's dead people and there's alive people in Christ. Not good and bad. I call it beach ball theology. Come on, we live at the beach, go to the beach, try to take a beach ball, and by your own power, get control of it and hold it under the water. This is what we were taught. That was drinking and smoking and chewing and not going girls who doing. That's what we're doing, all right? Well, how long can you do that? Depends on who you are. If you're swole, like my man on the front row, you probably do it for a long time. Eventually, what happens? Your arms get tired, wave hits you in the face, sunscreen gets slippery. And you let go of that beach ball, and if you ever notice, it never just gently comes back to the top. Go, hey, no. It just erupts in your face. And so the good news of the gospel is not try, try, try to hold this thing down. The good news of the gospel is Jesus walks by with a pocket knife and stabs a hole in your beach ball and sucks all the power out of it because he says it is finished. And so, that's it. Now what tends to happen some of you grew up in that kind of church. And then you got here and we're like, woo! I'm free. I can do whatever I want. Nope. I mean, the gospel is not licentiousness. Like, when we say that Jesus has set you free, he's not set you free to do whatever you want. That's not freedom at all. In fact, the people that do whatever they want, they're the least free people on the planet. They're either in prison or they are subject to just their wants and desires that have never taken them to a place of freedom. If you can say to God, I don't care what you say, I do what I want, and claim to be a Christian, there's a problem here. Because when you submit or surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if you were simultaneously saying, I do what I want, then by definition, he is not your Lord. So it's not, it's not legalism, and the gospel is not licentiousness. You see, two things were really recovered in the, the Great Reformation that was started by Martin Luther. The two things were authority, the authority of the word of God, and that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen. And every single one of us 
have this propensity to want to take faith, the good news of the gospel, that he died in our place, and add some works to it. We, we, instead of believing that faith in Jesus is enough, then we, I don't know why we want to do this, but all of us have a tendency to. I think it's because we're glory hounds, and we want credit too. Reminds me of this time that my in-laws gave, me a tra- gave us a trampoline for Christmas because they hate us. <laughs> <laughs> and so me and JP went to put the thing together. He was this big, and he's a train wreck, man. He was only unhelpful. <laughs> but when we walked back inside and mama said, where y'all been? And he says, we've been putting the trampoline together. <laughs> no, we have not. <laughs> and I think we walk up to heaven and God's been like, where you been? But We've been getting saved. No, you have not. You have added nothing to your salvation, but we're glory hounds. We want credit. And so we have this tendency to say it's faith plus works. There's a very, very famous Bible verse in Isaiah 64, 6. It says, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, which, which means like um, used menstrual rags. It was like the grossest thing you, that Isaiah could think of. So here's what's crazy about the way we respond to the gospel. Okay, the same activity on the surface could either bring glory to God or be so offensive you shouldn't talk about it in public. This, like, like today, you may respond to the gospel with extreme generosity. You may, you may give sacrificially to the glory of God and do it from the right place. Like having an overflow of gratitude because he is first and he went first and he loved you first. You've been praying about this thing and God leads you to bring your first and best and God is worshiped by it. He's like, look at my boy, look at my girl. Or you could write a bigger check because you've got an interview tomorrow and you're trying to put God in your debt and you're hoping that he'll sprinkle a little promotion dust on you. And he says, what are you doing? I'm astonished that you would treat me that way. The same act. The same thing is true in all of these. There are some denominations that believe it's not faith alone, it's faith plus baptism. It's faith plus baptism. In this denomination, here's what their doctrinal statement says. Remission of sins cannot be enjoyed by any person before immersion. What? Well, what do you do with the thief on the cross? Jesus promised he's going to heaven. And so they have to do this hermeneutical gymnastic to tell why it didn't count for him. Well, what if you got saved in Antarctica? Like, how are you going to baptize somebody? You just bang their head into the ice till they go to heaven. Like, what happens, man? But sorry, you didn't make it. You see how that's, a, that's faith plus baptism? Now, should you get baptized? If you were a believer in Jesus Christ, you should get baptized. On May 5th, you should get baptized. You should walk out there in the water. And because of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, you should join him publicly. But the water in the Atlantic Ocean will not save you. Have you been in it? It is not salvific. If you get baptized in one of our services, the water of JEA surely will not save you. You gotta be saved from it. And so if you were to walk out there in the water, we're gonna ask you a question. Who is Jesus to you? And if you were to say, he is my partner in my salvation, we would kick your pagan butt out of the water. Get back to class. You weren't paying attention. That's not what we do around here. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He has already saved you. And you're just going public with your faith and we will dunk you under the water and bring you back out just like Jesus was resurrected from the grave to a newness of life and the crowd goes wild. That's what we do. You should be baptized, but that water's not gonna save you. There are some denominations that believe faith plus religious activity saves you. Okay? Anybody come from a Catholic background? Anybody? See how they don't raise their hands? They don't raise their hands there, okay? (laughs) I know who you are. I see you right there, okay? Listen, listen. Now, before I dig into this, if you're saying, are you saying all Catholics are going to hell? No. Any person that surrenders their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is going to heaven. I'm also saying not all Baptists are going to heaven. You realize that? Here's a shocker. Not all 1122ers are going to heaven. There's not a Groupon. It's just, do you... Trust in Jesus. The problem with Catholicism in the Catholics is the doctrine of the Catholic Church. Because they believe that it's faith, it's good, it's good. It's just not enough. That you, you have to add to it. I didn't make this up. In Canon 14 at the Council of Trent, this was the Catholic Church's response to Martin Luther. See, so Martin Luther uncovers two things in the Protestant Reformation. One is about authority and one is about salvation. 
In the Protestant church, the authority is not me, thank God. The authority is the word of God, and all of us, the elders, the pastors, whatever meeting you have, submit and surrenders to this. In the Catholic church, authority is like a three-legged stool. It's the Bible, the Pope, and whatever councils or church fathers decide, and they're all on equal footing. The Council of Trent says, if anyone saith that man is truly absolved from his sins and justified because he is surely believed himself absolved and justified, or that no one is truly justified but he who believes himself justified, and that by his faith alone, absolution and justification are effected, let him be anathema, cursed to hell. So that's just the official Catholic doctrine. Faith alone won't save you. It's good, it's just not good enough. You have to do your part. And so this is faith plus works, plus baptism, plus first communion, plus confirmation, plus confession and penance, plus sacraments. So the doctrine of the Catholic Church is when you partake of the sacraments, then you are imparted with grace. If you do your part, God will do his part. In fact, there's a Catholic theologian named Ludwig Ott, so if you're looking for a baby name, maybe avoid Ludwig. And he says this, for the justified eternal life is both a gift of grace promised by God and a reward for his own good works and merits. Church, this is no gospel. It's not if you do your part, God does his part. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for anyone who would believe because of grace through faith in Christ, then you are imputed with his righteousness, that you don't earn it, that it is a gift. Not to jump ahead, but in Galatians 2.21, Jesus says, I mean, Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. So some of you grew up in a Pentecostal background, Church of God, Assembly of God, all right? We know who you are. It's very evident to tell during our worship time where you came from. Praise God for that. Great place to hire worship leaders. I love it, okay? The problem is, is that in, in some of these churches, they begin to not just lean in to experience the manifest presence of God, but to kind of get into like a hyper charismania, and they believe that without a certain sign gift, then you can't be saved. That it's Jesus plus a gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus plus speaking in tongues. And then what begins to happen is it becomes like a varsity and a JV version, and what begins to happen is people begin to chase after the gift instead of the giver of the gift. That people begin to, have to, to chase after an experience instead of experiencing a relationship with Jesus Christ. By the way, the Holy Spirit will always point to Jesus. He will never point to you. So it's not Jesus plus a gift. It's just faith alone. The other end of this is faith plus knowledge. That there are people that say, hey man, faith is good, but you've got to add to that knowledge. And if you don't know enough Bible and if you don't know enough about God, then you can't be saved. The real danger of this is you begin to treat the gospel like the ABCs, but the gospel is the A to Z. You begin to treat the gospel like it's the diving board, but the reality, it kind of gets you in the pool, but the reality is it's like the whole pool, diving board and all. We've shared this illustration a million times. It's in a book called The Cross-Centered Life. And the idea is that the way we ought to rightly revolve ourselves around the gospel is the guy draws a timeline. And then at some point, he draws a big cross and says, this is the moment you put your faith in Christ. And when you do this, two things simultaneously happen. That your understanding, our understanding of the magnificence and justice and holiness of God get bigger and bigger and higher and higher. And God is actually more to be revered than we ever imagined. And simultaneous to that, our understanding of our own life is not we're pretty good people that need a life coach, but that we are more depraved and more crooked and more black-hearted. Anybody ever realize that? Like the more you know Jesus, the more you look in the mirror and go, what is wrong with me? That is a good thing. That's called the conviction of, the, of, of sin by the Holy Spirit. And what happens is the distance between who you understand God to be and who you understand yourself to be just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the chasm grows wider and wider and wider and you begin to understand the only thing that can, that can reach from this side to that side is your ever-expanding understanding of the cross of Jesus Christ. When you begin to think that it's, when it's faith plus knowledge, you think that bridge gets you almost all the way there, but by your own effort, you take the final step to get in. That's not how it works. It's very popular in a lot of churches today that teach faith plus helpful tips. 
Like you go to church week after week after week and there's like, hey, here's 10 ways to be a good friend. There's six ways to improve your communication in marriage. Three ways to stay out of debt. And you could go for a long time and never hear about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. There, it, that's no gospel. I know you, some of you listen to a bunch of preaching online. You should just ask yourself this question. When's the last time this brother preached the gospel? It's very, very important. Now today, the pendulum has swung in another direction and there's a bunch of churches that think you don't even have to have faith. It's just good works. If you're a good person and do good things and fight for justice, then you'll be saved. Listen, does justice matter? Justice matters like crazy. But you fighting for justice will never justify you. It's the finished work of Christ on the cross. These are progressive churches, woke churches. That's called lost, by the way. That if you begin to use the gospel as a means to your political end, then you are worshiping you and your political agenda, not Christ crucified. And then what begins to happen in these churches is that people do not submit themselves to the authority of the word of God and say, I am under what you tell me, God, but they stand in authority over it and say, let me tell you who I am. That's dangerous, very, very dangerous. Good people don't go to heaven. Good gracious, none of us would ever make it. Look at your neighbor. Not good at all. Forgiven people go to heaven. Now, it's easy and kind of fun for me to pick on all those people. So let me give you this last one. Faith plus 1122 will not save you. I'm telling you, around here, we talk often about taking steps of discipleship in the direction of the good shepherd. But sponsoring a kid won't save you, being in a disciple group won't save you, getting baptized won't save you, worshiping with your hands up won't save you. And listen, we're all dangerous of this. I'm, this is where I fall into this camp really bad. I'm so judgy during worship about you, so judgy. I sit right over there, I'm into it, man. I can't help it, I can't help it. I don't know how you can help it. I'm just telling you, I don't know how. I can't get over the gospel. When here singing, man, and I go, hands up, tears down. And I look over and you're like, I'm like, probably not saved. Probably not. <laughs> it's not good. I'm confessing. You know why? Because I've seen you at the Jags game, man. I've seen you. Scoop and score and you're like, ah. We're singing. Come on, my soul. Don't you be shy on me. And you're like, oh, gosh. However, be careful that you don't judge somebody else's emotive response to the gospel based on your own wiring. A style of worship is not a prerequisite to salvation. It's not. You see, I'm, never, I'm not really good at like, like current illustrations. And uh, however, this week we had the solar eclipse, all right? How many of you saw the solar eclipse? I know, we saw you online. Look, you're in a cult with those goofy glasses on looking at the thing. What's wrong with you people? I, Mr. John, I was in the turkey woods thinking it was gonna get real dark and they were gonna gobble again. I was gonna shoot one in the head to the glory of God, okay? But I didn't have the glasses, so it was highly disappointing. I didn't even see anything. It's like a cloud went by. I was like, seriously? This is the, the event of a lifetime. You ever notice, I'm 50. I've seen like 20 of these events of a lifetime. The Weather Channel may be overplaying their hand. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> Storm of the century again this weekend, every time. All right, so, anyhow. But here's what I want you to think about. I saw the pictures that you took, they're incredible. Not the ones of you, the ones of the actual moon and the sun. So here's the thing. <clears throat> the moon in and of itself has no light. It's got no power, it's got no source of energy. All of the light, all of the source of power and energy comes from the sun. And I know, that, I know the moon has to do with like, you know, gravity and waves and tides, all that. But as far as we're concerned, its job is to reflect the light of the sun to the earth. That's its job. It's got one job. And when it tries to get in the way and say, look at me, and it blocks the sun, that is a dark way to live. Works-based righteousness is that, that we are not the source of light and power, that we are to reflect the good news of the gospel in the way we live, but when we try to be the source, that is a very dark way to live. And all of these examples that I gave, here's what I need you to understand, they're not bad things, they take a very good thing but if you make it a salvific thing, that's a really bad thing. It's like you, you Baptist. <laughs> What's funny, some of you grew up independent fundamentalist Baptist, and your church didn't think the Southern Baptists were good enough to go to heaven, okay? That's adorable. Holy living is a good thing. 
Applying the wisdom of the scriptures to your own life personally for reasons of sanctification are a good thing. Having guardrails for you are a good thing. If there are some things in your life that always cause you to sin and stumble and you have personally decided to stay away from those things, that is a good thing. But when you apply that as a measure of salvation for somebody else, that is not the gospel. Baptist, I'm talking about beer in case you hadn't picked up on that one. Okay? John Piper, who is a Baptist and the smartest guy, best preacher, I'm preaching with him tomorrow, I can't wait. He says this, and he's a teetotaler. This means he doesn't drink and never will and never has. And he says legalism has sent more people to hell than alcoholism and any other addiction ever has. Because it's not Jesus plus what you don't do. Baptism is a good thing. It's just not salvific. You should get baptized. Religious activity is a good thing. It helps cultivate your relationship with Jesus. A liturgy is a good thing because it helps keep your eyes focused on God and not the people on stage. It's a good thing. But when you make it the main thing, it's not a good thing. Gifts of the Spirit are a good thing. Every single believer in Christ has at least one gift. None of us have all of them, and they are to be yearned for and sought after because we need each other for the glory of God, the edification of the church. But you begin to lift that gift up as salvific is not good. Knowledge is a good thing, but if you make it the main thing, you begin to look down your nose at other people. Loving people just as they are is a good thing. But looking at a sinful lifestyle and calling it good is an evil thing. It's not, ev- it's not good at all. Justice is a good thing. We should demonstrate the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ by fighting for every image bearer on the planet. But the reason we do it is because the fight is finished at the cross in the empty tomb. Taking steps in the direction of the good shepherd is a good thing. It's just the result of the gospel, not a prerequisite for it. And so he ends his the four verses that we studied this way. He says, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Let him be damned to hell. You see, the gospel has to be received. Uh, Martin Luther wrote this commentary on Galatians. You gotta have a thesaurus to, to, and like a decoder ring to see what it says, but it's pretty awesome. He says this, for there is no middle ground between Christian righteousness and works righteousness. There is no alternative to Christian righteousness but works righteousness. If you do not build your confidence on the work of Christ, you must build your confidence on your own work. So the question I want to ask you is, have you received the gospel? Like a gift, have you received the good news that Jesus came and died in your place? I have a gift, somebody bring out the gift. And, uh, hi, Lena. Hey, give it up. She, she probably never wanted to be seen on stage. Here you go, look. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of people have been watching you, great. All right, look, so I got a gift here, okay? And it's in a Tiffany's box, you like this? It's actually a Tiffany's thing, because I'm a baller, that's why, okay? So, <laughs> now, what do you do to earn a gift? Nothing, no, if you earn it, it's not a gift. It's a wage. Have you ever received your paycheck and went to your boss and be like, thank you so much for the gift of my paycheck? No, 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 no. You're like, I've earned every dime of this. And now my dimes, I need like three dimes to count for what, five, you know what I mean? It's bad, all right? <laughs> but it's a gift. But if you, somebody gives you a gift but you don't receive it, what do you have to do? You have to open the gift to receive the gift. The gift of salvation is open right now, to, or offered right now to any one of you that would receive it. And for all who would believe, you receive the right to be called sons or daughters of the, God, of the Most High God. Amen. And so I want you to receive. Now, the reality is, is this isn't a gift. This is actually a a trophy, a trophy that I won. This is the first place trophy for the Tim Tebow Celebrity Golf Tournament. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and see how hip I am, it's Masters Sunday, all right? Don't y'all think Chef's got it? I think he does, pray for him, he's a Christian. And this too is a picture of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you may say, well how is that, Pastor? You just said, that a gift could be received and that the gospel is not earned, but yet you obviously earned this first place trophy at the Tim Tebow Celebrity Golf Tournament. Well, sort of, but not really. The reality is, is we had a team, and we play what's called Captain's Choice or a scramble. Uh, for, for those of you, anybody have a golfer in here? Raise your hand if you're a golfer. Okay, all right, good. That's why you came at nine o'clock, so you can be home for this afternoon. We'll talk about idolatry at another time, but whatever. Okay, so. So we played a scramble, so what that means is like everybody tees off and then you just hit, you just pick the best one. 
And then you hit it again, you pick the best one. You hit it again, you pick the best one. There were five people on our team. Doug Flutie was on my team. If you don't know who that is, Google him, he's awesome, all right? He's a quarterback back in the day, and he's about that tall, which was cool. Uh, my friend Big Mac, my friend named Jamie, and then there was another kid on our team uh, named Andrew, and I asked him, I met him three weeks ago in the lobby, and I was like, what do you do for a living? He's like, well, I'm trying to get my pro card in golf. I go, oh, I know what you're doing in three weeks. You're playing in the Tim Tebow <laughs> Celebrity Golf Tournament with this guy. Okay, so that's what we did. Now, as I reflect on my day at TPC Sawgrass, I don't think we used any of my shots. <laughs> I'm serious. One time it was like this far, and they're like, go ahead, Pastor. And I was like, ding. They're like, good job. Okay, now, so, because I drove the cart and put the team together. And in fact, when you play TPC, there's only one question. You play TPC, people are gonna ask you one, what's the question? How'd you do on 17? Okay, how'd you do on 17? So that's all that matters, man. That's all that matters. And so we're getting up there, we're playing really good, they're playing really good, I'm with them. And we get up to 17, and I got, I got, dude, and they put it back, they put it where the pros tee off. Normally, it got you around the edge, you know, where it's way closer, it's not, man. They're playing like 148, wind in our face, terrible. And I walk up there with two clubs, let me tell you, you walk up there with two clubs, you have no idea what you're doing. Mm, so bad. So I'm like, all right, man, in case you don't know golf, this is what you gotta do, grip it as hard as you can, swing with everything you're made of, just in case you hit it, all right? <laughs> I don't get nervous in front of people, but that time I'm like, oh, please. I'm, I'm praying the, the least theocentric prayers ever. God, if you'll just let me hit a hole in one here, I promise I'll do so many things for you. He did not hear my cry. All right. So I get up there and I hit it. I mean, I'm gonna just, I've already played it out in my mind. It's gonna be so awesome. And I duff the ball, so it would hit you in the head. That's how far it went. Just, <laughs> you could hear the crowd go, oh. I mean, it was not. Doug Flutie reaches in his pocket, throws me a Hail Mary. Try it again, Reverend. That's what it is. <laughs> and so I did. Now, in golf, you don't get two chances. But I'm a Christian. I play by grace, not the law. <laughs> and I thought, all right, here it is. This is going to be the one. And this one, I strike the ball better in the water. You know why? Because what I need is not a second chance. I could stay there all day and probably never get it up there. You understand? And so my friend, I think Big Mac on this one, puts one right in the middle. We tap in for birdie. I don't know how long I would have been there. And we write down birdie on the scorecard. We go to, we go to 18, all right? 18 is right to left. Just so you know, if you're a golfer, I don't do right to left. I do left to right, all right? <laughs> and if your slice lands in the fairway, they call it a fade. And so I hit this thing as hard as I can. It starts out over the water and it lands. I mean, it's the best golf shot maybe I've ever made. I mean, I stroke this ball. I mean, to the point where I finish, I flip my golf club like they do in baseball. <laughs> they don't even do that in golf. I do, whatever. I point at the Make-A-Wish kids. That's what you came for right there. <laughs> so, and I'm like, finally, man, I get to contribute. <laughs> that kid, Andrew, the guy's trying to be a pro, dude, he hits his... His is still going up when it goes through. He's like, hey, little guy. Just, <laughs> I mean, it's so good. Here's what I realized. Not only did we not use my bad shots, we didn't even use my good shots. <laughs> we birdie 18, we get finished, we have two scorecards. I have a scorecard, and my team has a scorecard. And when we went to turn in the card, I threw mine in the trash, and I handed them our scorecard, and I have a first place trophy <laughs> for the Tim Tebow tournament. Listen, man, that's the gospel. I'm telling you, as you watch the Masters today, it's different because they don't play on teams. That's the gospel. One day when he returns, he ain't coming to tell stories. He came and he lived the perfect life and he died on the cross for you. And one day you will stand before the Master and you got one of two options. You can turn in your scorecard, and if you do, it won't be enough. It just won't be enough. And the way you will pay the debt for that scorecard is an eternal separation from a holy God. The good news of the offer of the gospel for anyone who would believe, Jesus says, you wanna take my scorecard? He lived the life on our behalf and died our death in our place. And anyone who would believe you get to turn in your old life 
and you get to receive his perfect righteousness. That is the gospel. Nothing needs to be added to it. So my question is, have you received that as a gift? And if you say, well, how do I receive that, Pastor? We read the verse in Romans 10, 9. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the grave, that he accomplished everything that he needed to accomplish through the cross and the resurrection, and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. I wanna give you the opportunity to do that right now. Would you bow your head, would you close your eyes? And if you wanna receive the free gift of salvation for the very first time, it's not by anything that you do, but just right now receive it. In your heart, just confess, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. And if you're doing that, just as a, an act of worship, would you lift your hand as high as you can in the air? If you, for the very first time, wanna receive the free gift of salvation, lift your hand as high as you can and you say, Jesus, I claim you as my Lord. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, God, we love you more than anything because you first loved us God, I thank you that you did not come to say, if we, then you, but it's the exact opposite way. Because of what you have done through the perfect life of your son, his death on the cross, his resurrection, that for anyone who would believe that we would receive the right to be called sons and daughters of God. And so God, I thank you that in this moment right now, there are men and women and students whose sins are being paid for, who are being adopted into your family who are being resurrected to eternal life. And for that, you are worthy of our praise. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you please stand as we respond? We believe that the gospel demands a response. We're gonna respond by singing. We're gonna sing, it's like a modern hymn. And it is about what Christ did on our behalf counts for us. If you're saved, you ought to sing like it. And we're gonna bring our tithes and our offerings, not to put God in our debt, but because he loved us first and he gave us Jesus. So we bring to him our first and best. And we are going to pray. And because of what he has done, he has invited you and me as children in the kingdom to come to the king who's sovereign over everything. And even if you're like, well, it's not that big a deal. It's a big deal to him because you're a big deal to him. So cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Let's sing, let's bring, let's pray. Let's respond.
joy of my salvation should be my final God that it is finished and let's celebrate with the 48 men and women at all of our campuses and online that today was the day. Listen, if that was you, if you're here in this room, Pastor Joby and I will be out in the lobby. We'd love to celebrate with you and walk you right over to the Connect Center to get you signed up to get baptized for beach baptism coming up on May 5th. Church, we love you like crazy. Can't wait to dig in again next week in Galatians. Be free.